Then I will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, my scattered people, will bring me offerings. On that day, you, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and not lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honour in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time I will gather you. At that time I will bring you home. I will give you honour and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. At home I have what I call my special box. It's a big plastic storage box with a sealable lid and in it are my personal treasures. My baby book that mum kept as a diary of my first year, mementos from our wedding, orders of service for other significant weddings and funerals, class photos from school, cards I receive for milestone birthdays, letters from friends and family, words of affirmation from work colleagues. You know, trinkets and bits and bobs that not even my kids would know what they're doing there and why they're significant, but they evoke significant memories for me. Things that belong to mum and dad that take me back to specific days of joy and connection. They are priceless treasures. There's nothing sad or bad in there, but if I do shed a tear while I'm rummaging through it, it's because they are tangible reminders of being dearly loved. I wonder if you've got something similar, something tucked away, a box uh, or a collection of treasures that remind you of your significant relationships, reminders of love given and received. Because if you do, I've got something to add to it today. And if you don't, I have something exceptionally precious for you to start your collection. In fact, this one is worthy of its own special container. I'd like you to open up a special place in your heart, maybe even pushing aside some of the other things that are clamouring for attention and place in there, Zephaniah 3, 9 to 20. This is God's precious word to every one of his dearly loved children. He spoke it first to the people of Israel, but since we've been grafted into them, we share in his deep delight and love. And contained within this beautiful gift is probably my second favourite verse in the whole Bible, if you're allowed to do that, Uh, a genuine hidden treasure of God's love. So let's see why this passage deserves such a special place in our hearts. Back in chapter 1, it was a very clear expression of God's judgement on the whole world, Chapter 2, they got very specific and both chapters show why that judgment is necessary. But like for the absolute majority of the prophets and for the whole Bible, God will not let judgment be his final word. Instead, we see that blessing, love, mercy, grace, reconciliation, joy are going to be the final words of God to us. We've caught flashes of that throughout Zephaniah already, but here it burns with a radiant intensity. Zephaniah 3, 9 to 20 is the motion of God who is stretching his arms around the world and gathering his beloved people in, the furthest first, 
until he is in the midst of a great number where he sings for joy over them and they sing their joy for him. It echoes in the joy of his people returning from exile in Babylon, but this chapter has its greater fulfilment in the last days when all his people are brought home to be at peace, perfectly safe, in his embrace forever. Starting there in verses 9 and 10, we see God's intention for the nations revealed. Verse 8, where we finished off last week, all the nations are gathered to experience God's righteous justice, but without a break. Verse 9, God promises, then I will purify the lips of the peoples and all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. We got a glimpse of that back last week in chapter 2, verse 11. Where, God says, uh, where Zephaniah says, distant nations will bow down to him, all of them in their own lands, this beautiful global reach of God's grace going to all parts of the world. So that there will be people scattered every part of the world who will call on the name of the Lord. But you notice in that verse where it says that they'll serve God shoulder to shoulder. What a beautiful description of the unity of God's people. No ethnic, cultural or political walls between us. You know, shoulder to shoulder, that close, of one mind, united in purpose. Happy to be in close proximity to one another, sharing life together. Remember this because we'll see more mentions of our closeness later on. But for now, verse 10, we see how far scattered those people are. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, my scattered people, will bring me offerings. Last week, chapter 2 uh, Zephaniah went west, east, south and north to sort of talk about the extent of God's justice and judgment and we saw that Cush back then, only got one verse, but it was representing all the nations south of Jerusalem. And here in this verse, it's even beyond that, beyond the rivers of Cush, God's people are going to be ingathered. And last week I said that we can see ourselves. If there are nations far scattered to the south of Jerusalem, well, then that's us. We're as far scattered as you can get from there. And so in this verse, here we are, the furthest nations mentioned first in this great gathering of God's people. And then in verses 11 to 13, we're in chapter 2, Jerusalem. After going all around the compass, Zephaniah focused in to the centre, to Jerusalem, And that was uh, a a centre of judgement. But here, Jerusalem becomes a centre of blessing. The pride which plagued chapter 2 is done away with. The haughty and arrogant will be removed. And just as Jesus promises in the Beatitudes, the meek, the humble, inherit the earth. Verse 12, I will leave within you the meek and humble. Lies and deceit are done away with in verse 13. And so that's how we get to serve shoulder to shoulder. Because pride and arrogance and deceit and lies are all things that poison unity. They're the reasons why we erect our defensive walls, because we've been harmed in the past. And so, when that being the way the world works, it's almost impossible to conceive of a world where those things will no longer trouble us. God's going to remove those things. No more second-guessing, wondering what's behind that question or comment from someone. Fully able to trust everyone at their word. No more ego games or exclusion or in-groups and out-groups. No wonder God concludes this section with a beautiful description at the end of verse 13. They will eat and lie down and no one will make them afraid. That's Psalm 23 language where we are a flock who are well looked after, able to lie down. You know, we are safe. We're not constantly alert waiting for someone to attack us. What a beautiful relief that is. No more hypervigilance, no more constant alertness, watching our backs. Yeah, it's Psalm 4 language that says, In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. It's Romans 8. Nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's Revelation 7. For at the Lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God bringing us in, giving us a safe, beautiful place to be 
at rest. We enjoy God's constant care and provision and protection here and now, and we'll see the day when every threat is abolished, fully at peace, utterly safe, completely healed, no more tears, at rest. Verse 15, the Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. Now, I know that for some of us, that fear of harm is a heavy weight that we bear daily. And it's been long constructed by the arrogant and violent. And for some of us, lies and deceit of the proud are crushing our souls. Now, they pile up lie after lie to overwhelm us and to stay in control. And we're spending all our time and energy trying to to correct that, to expose that deceit. And we finally do that to them. Well, they just jump to the next lie without even blushing. How long, Lord? These things can be relentless. We just don't have the energy to endure this, and that's exactly what these people want. They're counting on it. How long? Well, not too long. God is about to usher us into an eternity of peace, an eternity of rest and care, an eternity of gentle humility and shoulder-to-shoulder work where no division can get in the way. Can you imagine what eternity is going to be like on the new earth? (laughs) It's almost impossible to think about that. Free of all these things that weigh us down now where we'll be in joyful cooperation with one another, that there'll be an astounding diversity from every nation, working and rejoicing and resting together in complete harmony. Just thinking of that means uh, like our souls expand into that wonderful freedom, finally fully able to be all that we were created and redeemed to be unrestricted, unhindered, unafraid. It's a vision calling us forward to what God's doing in the Lord Jesus. We're only just a few verses in, but if that's our present and future blessing in the Lord Jesus, what's our response to that? Verse 14. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. We sing. We give full voice to our heart as we let uh, verse 15 sink in. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. Back in chapter 3, verse 1, Jerusalem was the city of oppressors. Now she is daughter, Zion. God has worked his salvation. He's taken away our punishment. We are dearly loved, precious, honoured, delighted in by God, daughter Jerusalem. No wonder she and we can be glad and rejoice with all our heart. And I think singing is probably the best way to express that. It's the way that we can unite our mind and body and soul in this one act of our whole being. It expresses the emotions of our words. And then when we sing together, we can bring me to tears in a, in a good way. Because with many voices as one voice, we sing the same words that express our unified hearts, shoulder to shoulder, in our delight in God. Up the front here, I can hear the harmonies, diversity and unity. And you cover my voice so I can hide in your praises and together we can express more than I could ever do on my own. In response to all that God has done, we sing with joy. And if verses 9 to 13 aren't, haven't given us enough reasons to be glad and rejoice with all our heart, well, let's look at verse 17. And when I began studying Zephaniah, there was a lot of commentators who had a go at him for being unoriginal and boring. I think we've thought, we've seen how wrong they are. But Zephaniah could have written chapter 3, verse 17, and then walked off, and we would have a priceless treasure. I said it's probably my second favourite verse in the whole Bible. And I think it's one of the reasons for that is because it feels like I just stumbled across it. Last year we had the chance to be in Krakow, Poland, and we were wandering the streets and we came across the Czartoryski Museum and it promised swords and spears and shields. And so I'm, I'm in on that. But I think Catherine knew about this beforehand and had planned this trip that I just sort of stumbled into. But weapons, yep, I'm in. We go and we go through all these great rooms of all these old weapons. And then we walked into a room where on the opposite wall 
was Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the lady with the ermine. I was completely astounded. I wasn't expecting a da Vinci painting in this, uh, in this museum, and it's a stunning painting. 500 years old, and the colours are so rich. The ermine, the sort of weaselly looking thing in the lady's arms, is full of life, sort of wriggling to get out of her arms. We spent ages enjoying it. And that's how I feel about this verse. You know, I must have read it before, but one day it jumped out at me and captivated me and gave me an insight into the character of God that melted my heart. So if you've got just only room for just one more verse in your special box, make it this one. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Can we spend some time looking at this verse like we would a work of art, delighting in its colours and composition? Or like a precious gemstone, so turning around to catch all the facets, each radiance of glory? Because I can't do it justice. Maybe it's worth a long, luxurious soak in it. Uh, It's luxurious waters removing our stress and restoring our souls. It's got five lines in it. The first line, the Lord your God is with you. Literally, it's God is in your midst. So the trajectory of this passage started with God's people scattered from beyond the rivers of Cush, his scattered people being drawn into his embrace. He's found each one, wherever they are, and has brought them close. He's the father of millions of prodigal children, wrapping them up in his embrace, welcoming them into his joy, and there he is, right in the very centre of it all, right in the midst. When the people of Israel journeyed through the wilderness, the tabernacle was set up right in the centre of the camp, right in their midst. And God doesn't wish us well from a distance, He's in our midst. He's actually even closer to that. So if you can imagine the tribes of Israel camped in their various tribal groups uh, around the tabernacle, the tabernacle right in the very centre, later the temple, is the place of God's special presence. Now, as the Holy Spirit has made his home in each believer, we are no longer camped around the tabernacle. We have been brought in so close that we are being built into the temple Itself. Peter calls us living stones in whom God dwells by his spirit. He could not be closer to us than that. Pleased to live in the midst of his people. Not out there, not up there, in our midst. God has promised that when we meet in Jesus' name, Jesus is right here, present among us. He shares our life and promises to never leave us nor forsake us. The second line, the mighty warrior who saves. That's why in verse 13, we'll be able to eat and lie down and no one will make us afraid because he's the mighty warrior who protects us. He's done everything for us. He's our defender and our shield, our mighty rock of refuge. He's done what we couldn't do, save us. Our Lord Jesus, our champion, has gone into battle against our great foes and he has conquered In that great chapter on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is just exultant. He says, death has been swallowed up in victory. Thanks be to God. He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's death. In Revelation 12, the great dragon, Satan, is cast down and a loud voice sings in heaven, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah, For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. Death done away with. Satan cast down. The mighty warrior has saved us and he's saved us for all eternity. Line three. This is just beautiful. He will take great delight in you. Now that you is plural, but it's made up of individuals. As God looks at his people, he's not saying, well, on the whole, I'm delighted with you. He's not saying, on average, I'm delighted. You know, there's a few exceptions to that. But on the whole, I'm delighted with you. Generally speaking, he means all of his people. Every single one of his people, he takes 
delight in? You. God takes delight in you. What do you think about when you come to worship together? Sometimes we're so busy uh, and so hectic, we don't get a chance to think about what we're about to do. Sometimes it can be feel routine and it's just what we do, so we walk in without much thought. Sometimes we do get a chance to think about what we're doing. Have you ever thought about what God's thinking when we come together for worship? He is taking great delight in you. His face is turned towards you in love and joy and blessing. In those times when you're by yourself, maybe sitting reading his word or talking with him on the fly as the day races along, he takes great delight in you. Maybe you're on your own, there's not much to offer that you can think of. He takes great delight in you. He is your loving Heavenly Father and you are his child. It's not anything you can do because Jesus has done it all. God delights in you because that's who he is. You're his child. You belong to Jesus. Ah, he loves it. He delights in you. 1 John 3 verse 11, just to show that Zephaniah is not alone in saying this. John says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Paul describes us often as dearly loved children. And that love is expressed in his delight in you. Line four. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you. The older version of the NIV and other translations put it, he will quiet you with his love. Since that book and movie, The Horse Whisperer, came out, we've had a run of whisperers, cat whisperers, dog whisperers, lion whisperers. Uh, it's for any animal that's frightened or been mistreated. They, they snap back, they snarl and bite, but the whisperer sort of comes in and with quiet, gentle, kind words, a non-threatening presence, he seems to be able to restore, she restores that animal to peace and trust and calm. It's a completely insufficient picture, but that's the image I get when I hear that, that God will quiet you with his love. His love brings quiet to our soul. He soothes the troubled heart. And even in this verse, he's speaking reassuring words of his faithful love, his ongoing presence, his delight in us. Martin Luther says in this verse, God will cause you to be silent, So you may have in the secret places of your heart a very quiet peace and a peaceful silence. That just ability just to put aside all what's going on out there and just to stop and rest in his love. The clamour of the world around us, the proud and arrogant voices accusing, even our own hearts make us flighty and unsettled. Well, then he speaks his promises to us so that we're at rest and nothing can make us afraid or ashamed. The Psalms speak of this. He sets a table for me in the presence of my enemies. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. When we realise how deeply and eternally loved we are, then our hearts can be at peace. Our souls are stilled and quieted in his love. Line five, the last one. God will rejoice over you with singing. What a way to finish. Don't force me to try and pick my favourite out of these five lines, but this one was the one that stopped me in my tracks. The word rejoice here has an exuberance to it. It's connected to dancing for joy, shouting for joy. God isn't holding anything back and he's delight in his people. He is singing for joy. It's amazing, isn't it? That God sees his people and he bursts into song. This isn't just Zephaniah telling us this. Isaiah 62, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God Rejoice over you. Jesus tells us in John 15, I've told you this so that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be complete. 
In Nehemiah 8, verse 10, we have the fairly famous words, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that's not speaking about our joy in the Lord. It's his joy in us that gives us strength. And his joy here is expressed in his singing over us. What an absolutely delightful truth. You know, this is what we see in Revelation, the throne again at the centre in the midst of all creation, surrounded by all creation, God's redeemed people, singing for joy to him, and we see here that God is singing as well. But not only then, not only are we looking forward to that later, we hear and are caught up in God's singing now. Psalm 32 tells us, You are my hiding place, you will protect me from trouble, and surround me with songs of deliverance. God is the mighty warrior who saves, and he delights in that. He sings as he does it. He surrounds us with these songs, and those songs of deliverance are expressed in verses 18 to 20. don't have time to look at them, but if you read 18 to 20, you'll find, I will, I will, eight times. I wills, promising to bring us home, promising to give praise and honour, promising to bring healing and restoring. He delights over his people. He sings for joy over them and it's his pleasure to bring us safely home. Zephaniah's prophecy, like the other prophets, like the whole Bible, doesn't end in judgement but salvation. The very last words of the Bible are, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with God's people. So the ark of Zephaniah 3, 9 to 20, is God stretching his arms all around the world, gathering his beloved people in the furthest first, until he's in the midst of this great number, where he sings for joy over them, and we sing for joy in him. This will be our experience in eternity. It's our experience in the meantime, God's loving presence with his people, our mighty warrior who saves and sings. Put it in your special box. Memorise it. Don't let it go. Let God speak his peace and joy to your heart. Let him quiet you with his love. Hear his delight in you. Hear his commitment to you in his love. How about we pray about that? Let's pray. Father, we know that there are many sort of stereotypes and caricatures about you and who you are out in the world and sometimes we've inherited those where it's a negative view of you. But here we see this beautiful verse that reminds us of who you truly are, the mighty one who saves, the one who takes delight in your people, the one who rescues us and quiets us, the one who sings over your people with joy. Father, what a beautiful joy it is for us to be counted among that group of people who have the privilege and joy of singing our joy to you for all that you've done for us in the Lord Jesus, for all you are in yourself, loving us without us loving you first, finding a way to bring us home, going out after the lost ones and gathering us up from all parts of the world, bringing us together that we might serve shoulder to shoulder, that we might be one together. Thank you that we're getting a taste of that even now in church. But we can't wait for that day when all the things that have troubled us and brought those tears will be done away with, the tears wiped away, and we'll be singing to you and you to us and we'll be enjoying one another and you forever. May that uh, quiet in our hearts, even this week. May it give joy to our conversations with others. May it free us to be giving uh, that same kind of love to the people that you introduce us to this week. May we be able to find rest and be able to know that in the midst of the chaos and the, the accusing voices that come to us from outside and within, you might steal our souls to know and remember how deeply loved we are by you, how committed you are to us, that we will find rest And there will be nothing to make us afraid. 
May we be able to live closely with you in that shadow of your presence, you the one who is our mighty rock of refuge. Hear our joy this morning as we hear yours. In Jesus' name, amen.